Tensions between the U.S. and Iran are building. Massive crowds you see here taking to the streets in Tehran and other Iranian cities to mourn the death of General Qasem Soleimani. They also demanded revenge against the U.S. A drone strike killed Iran's top military leader, and President Trump is threatening more possible violence. He tweeted, the U.S. is prepared to hit 52 Iranian targets, including cultural sites, if Tehran attacks again. He also notified Congress on Twitter that he's ready to quickly and fully strike back. Democrats think the president should have asked for congressional approval before killing Soleimani. The cycle of escalation is something that could lead us to war. Then shouldn't we have a conversation about that in Congress and as a country? We would have been culpably negligent had we not taken this action. The American people would have said that we weren't doing the right thing to protect and defend American lives. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the House will soon vote on a war powers resolution to limit the president's military actions. Now, in this area, some Iranian Americans are concerned about being harassed because of the U.S. tension with their homeland. Let's go to Lindsay Nadra. She spoke to a Happy Valley City Councilor who hopes the Trump administration will de-escalate things quickly. Lindsay? Yeah, Happy Valley City Councilor David Amami was born here but still has family in Iran. He says a war is the last thing we need. It's been tough. I have to admit I haven't slept much the last three days. I have family over there. Um, I have family in Iran. I have family in the military in Iran. I have family in the military in America. Um, and I, the last thing we need is another war. David remembers facing discrimination as a child and says during Desert Storm, his family's car was vandalized and neighbors received anonymous threats. But as an adult, it's not really something he's had to deal with. Now, though, he worries for younger generations and hopes people aren't targeted because of the way they look, because of what's going on. He hopes the Trump administration will work to de-escalate the situation with Iran, but worries the president's tweet about targeting 52 Iranian sites could only make things worse. These cultural sites are, are what's most dear to the people and to if you're saying that you're trying to help the Iranian people keep America safe, then then why would you attack the cultural sites that the people and tourists visit every day, that the stuff that's that's dear to people's hearts? I mean, that's that's what um, that's what terrorist organizations do. That's not what America is about. Well, David isn't the only Iranian American I spoke with who has concerns about possible discrimination. I'll have much more on this coming up at six. Thank you, Lindsay. The Council on American Islamic Relations says more than 60 Iranians and Iranian Americans were detained at the Washington Canada border. One of those was Nega Hekmati. She spoke today at a news conference in the Seattle area. She says she crossed the border in Blaine with her husband and two kids. All of them are U.S. citizens. She says agents took her car keys and their passports. They were held for five hours and faced a barrage of questions from border agents. Hekmati says her kids were terrified. They were very anxious. They were very scared uh, that if they go to sleep, they may take us to the jail and they wake up and see we're not there. And my daughter was telling me, please don't speak Farsi. If you don't speak Farsi, maybe they don't take you. Customs and Border Protection has denied the claim, saying social media posts that CBP is detaining Iranian Americans and refusing their entry into the U.S. because of their country of origin are false. Washington Representative Pramila Jayapal was at the news conference today. She doesn't believe Border Patrol. And I just think it's important that we recognize that this is the same agency that also uh, denied that family separations uh, was happening. Jayapal condemned any possible war with Iran. She's calling on Congress to take action to prevent a war. So what's happening with Iran is a lot of people concerned, frankly. They're talking about a possible military draft at this point. Now, on social media, these claims are saying that anyone who has applied for a student loan is automatically on this list. Right, a lot of questions to be answered here. So we have Jason Puckett with our Verify team try to figure out what's true. The Selective Service website crashed over the weekend because so many people were going to look up answers about a U.S. draft. And there's a lot of misinformation out there, like sites falsely trying to make you pay to register and claims you can't go to college without signing up. We're breaking down the facts, not to add any anxiety, but to let you know what's really going on. First off, 
we don't have a draft right now. We haven't had an open draft in the U.S. since 1973. A draft itself is when U.S. citizens are actively being called and enlisted in the military without volunteering. It requires an act of Congress. Both houses would have to vote to pass it and the president would have to sign off on it. Now, if that did happen, which again, hasn't occurred since Vietnam, that doesn't just mean men and women would start being drafted left and right. In fact, women wouldn't be drafted at all. As the law stands right now, only men would be drafted. And in the US, all men between 18 and 25 are legally required to register. That's where these memes came from. Many posters commenting that they registered for the draft by applying for a FAFSA student loan. And that's actually true. To qualify for FAFSA or any federal aid, a male U.S. citizen does have to be registered with the Selective Service System. Now you can do it on a FAFSA application when you get your driver's license or just mailing your form in. Bottom line, it's a requirement. And failure to register is actually a felony. But registering for a draft isn't an actual draft. The Selective Service has a list of eligible people, but Congress would have to declare war and they'd have to legally instate a draft before they could use that list. At that point, the men, 18 to 25, who registered with Selective Service could be drafted, but it's not a guarantee. According to the Selective Service, an actual draft would use a lottery system to call registered men. They'd then have to pass a series of physical and mental tests to be considered. Now, we understand the concern that comes anytime someone starts talking about a draft, but it's important to remember we haven't had one in more than 45 years, and it would take multiple acts of Congress before people would even start getting call. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. So we're going to stay on top of the Iran situation on all of our platforms, and you don't want to miss tonight NBC Nightly News. Lester Holt is going to look at how the U.S. is protecting Americans from any possible attack. Let's take a look at the weather. The wet weather already causing some issues. Take a look at the damage to this yes. car. A small tree fell into that Subaru, and you can see there that it cracked the windshield. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office shared these photos on Twitter. This all happened near Northwest 8th Avenue and Cornelius Pass Road earlier today. Deputies say the driver, the driver was in the car and did have some cuts, but is otherwise okay. I think about that sometimes and I always say, what are the odds of that actually happening? So if my, my heart goes out to that driver there. Meteorologist Matt Safino uh, checking in with us now. It's going to be a wet week, Matt. Yeah, it's been a really blustery day today with the rain and the wind. Both are beginning to back off a bit, though. You wouldn't really know looking outside. It's 50 degrees and still a south wind at 18 miles an hour, which may not sound very strong, but it's enough to get your attention if you're out there. It is still very, very blustery. Here are the current winds around the region still sustained at 21 at Aurora, backed off at Scappoose quite a bit. Still some pretty good winds on the coast. Newport sustained at 24, but the gusts have been impressive and these are just in the metro area. Aurora leading the list with a 40 mile an hour gust today. Portland and a gust of 32, Hillsborough 35, Salem 33 and McMinnville 31. So there are your wind gusts from today. It has been a blustery day and a rainy one as well. And that's going to be the theme through the week, the rain, not so much the wind. In fact, the rain and the wind are easing right now, but they'll pick right back up tomorrow afternoon. So a little bit of a break, but not a huge one. We're looking at heavy mountain snow all week long. I'll show you how much a little bit later and it gets colder this weekend too. We'll talk about that. Back to you guys. All right, more from Matt soon. Thank you, sir. A driver hit and killed a Gresham Middle School student in a crosswalk this morning. The 11 year old was hit near the intersection of Southeast 5th and Hogan Road, just a few blocks away from Dexter McCarty Middle School. You can see some of the damage here to the car in the front of that vehicle there. The bumper and the hood smashed. The front windshield cracked as well. Police say the driver did pull over and is cooperating with the investigation. We are just a few weeks from the start of the Jeremy Christian trial. He's charged with killing two people on a max train in 2017. And today the judge ruled on potential evidence in that case. Here are the three big takeaways. The judge decided the jury can walk through a max train similar to the one where the deadly stabbings happened. Prosecutors also want to show a video at trial of Christian ranting and making threats the day before the stabbings. A ruling on that is expected in the next few days. The judge also said Christian can be in court during jury selection. Opening statements are expected to begin on January 28th. Portland's new police chief is opening up about her goals for the department as she settles into the new role. Chief Jamie Resch spoke publicly for the first time at the Justice Center this morning. Resch started with the department a while back, though, back in 1999. She served as a patrol officer and neighborhood response team officer. Most recently, Resch served as assistant chief. She'll plan to use her experience to her advantage, especially to bring community groups together. I might be able to move some of these relationships um, 
uh, farther quicker uh, just because I already have the relationship. So I would like to see that. I would like to see some things change a little faster as far as like our ability to build um, trust within the community with different groups and, and things like that. I think I might have the ability to do that. Not to doubt her in the position, but the decision here to bring Rash on as the chief was swift after former chief Daniel Outlaw, who you saw in the video there, accepted a job in Philadelphia. And some people have been a little critical of the mayor, Mayor Ted Wheeler, for this, asking why there wasn't transparency in the hiring process as has been promised before. Mayor Wheeler told us today he already knew Rash. He trusted her and believes she is the best person for the job. Okay. Across the bridge in Vancouver, a new fire chief is making history. Kristen Maurer is the first female fire chief at Clark County Fire District 6. Maurer started as a firefighter and paramedic in 1999. She'll be in charge of three stations and around 60 full-time staff and 20 volunteers. She'll officially be sworn in tomorrow night at 730.